good Wednesday to you. Thank you for joining us for um, another Wednesday uh, in the Word here at Six Mount Zion Baptist Church. Uh, we are starting a new Bible study series. For those of you who've been with us, uh, really for the past uh, four or five months, we've been looking at uh, two of Kent Keefe's pieces, um, Do It Anyway, Jesus Did It Anyway, and um, Have Faith Anyway. So we've been looking at uh, all three of them since June, and we concluded last week after several months of looking at the Ten Paradoxical Commandments and looking at the book of Habakkuk. We're going to um, shift and use as a guide uh, Mark Batterson's um, uh, really a combination of two pieces. And Mark Batterson has a new piece, Chase the Lion, which is uh, really like a companion piece to um, In a Pit with a Lion on a Snowy Day. Mark Batterson pastors um, a huge church in in uh, D.C. Uh, with eight campuses, National Community Church, uh, and we we've, we've used their pieces before, and um, and so we're gonna we're gonna pick up with it today. We're gonna jump right on in, and this Bible study primarily will focus on Second Samuel, and we're gonna start off today. Um, uh, with the 23rd chapter, and I think we're going to be hovering around these these verses the entire time. And so um, I want you to, for a second, listen to the 20th and the 21st verse um, verses of Second Samuel, the 23rd chapter, uh, and, and we'll jump right in. Benaiah, son of Jehoiada, a valiant fighter from Capsule, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. Uh, it's easy to read verses <clears throat> like this in, in the comfortable confines of the church, comfortable confines of our homes or our offices, and actually miss the, the monumental act of, of carriage that is displayed by Benaiah. Uh, but when we look at this text, uh, you know, it, it's hard to overlook what Benaiah um, has done. All right. Now, most of the time when you hear about lions, you do not hear about people chasing lions. You hear about lions chasing people, but you don't hear about people chasing, um, chasing lions. Now, you know, I, I've seen it on TV well, not even really people um, chasing lions. I, I've seen lions chasing people on TV. Um, you know, when the circus used to be around, you know, I go to the go to the, the circus and um, I see the tamers uh, try to control the lions. But I've never seen anybody actually um, being a lion chaser. All right, now. Um, and, and the text doesn't really let us know that um, Benaiah actually has any tools. He doesn't have a rifle, uh, doesn't have a squad with him. Um, you know, this wasn't any type of uh, safari that he was on. It, it just says that a valiant fighter performs great exploits, struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion now um you know mark Battison eisegetes this piece in his in his book and uh, he begins to you know paint a picture and tells us what what could have happened um you know benaya had come upon this lion and when he came upon the lion uh, and, and he gives us a full script of what happened. I, I won't bore you with all the details, uh, but we know nothing other than Benaya went down into a pit on a snowy day and killed a lion. All right. Now, you know, I've shared again. I, I mean, I, I just shared it and I said again, normal people run away from lions. All right. But lion chasers are are wired differently and th this is really what this whole uh th what this whole piece is about it really is and, and it can be something that is um inconceivable but also something that can be inspirational 
And that there was a moment where where Benea, instead of running from, um, actually runs toward or runs into a situation, um, you know, where uh, normal folk would, would run away from it. Now, one of the central themes that uh, Mark Battison wants us to to get is this. God is in the business of strategically positioning us in the right place at the right time. You know, God is good. That, that's what uh, Battison wants us to understand. God is good at getting us where God wants us to be. Where, where God wants us to go. God is great at positioning us for place and time. All right. Now, now here's the thing, though. The right place often seems like the wrong place. And the right time often seems like the wrong time. And I noticed somebody out there already saying, saying, amen. Yeah, God strategically sets us up. But a lot of times what we think is right seems wrong but what we think is wrong is really right and and whether it's place or whether it's time god has a way of setting it up so that even when it seems like it is the wrong place um it can end up being uh the right place and the right time and so Battison, as he starts his journey into kind of setting us up for what we're going to be discussing for the next couple of weeks. And this, this is really what I want you to start to set your mind um, toward. That there are some moments that you're going to have to chase the lion. All right. There are going to be some times when you're going to have to run after what does not make sense. All right. And God, this is what God will do. God will turn what could what could have been considered a bad break into a a big break it god can take what in your eyes seems to be the wrong time in the wrong place in the wrong situation wrong circumstance and god can set that thing up um to to work out for your good Battison shares this in the book he says encountering a lion in the wild can be typically a bad thing not even can be is typically a bad thing a really bad thing, he says, finding yourself in a pit with a lion on a snowy day generally qualifies as a horrible, very bad day. That combination of circumstance spells out one thing, in particular for you, and that's death. All right. I don't think anyone would have bet any money on Benea uh, winning this fight. Now, put this thing in perspective. A lion. All right. And I, I, I saw some. I saw thought, saw something that said lions could weigh up to 500 pounds. Some even larger. Some can jump um, 30 feet at a time. They can run up to speeds of 35 miles per hour. They are ferocious. Their claws are. Um, they can rip your skin and dig into your flesh. Their teeth can rip you apart. I don't know many human beings who want much to do with lions, all right? Why? Because it doesn't make sense. You know, it's not set up for us uh, to win in that situation. But, uh, but, 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 Naya, on a snowy day, all right? This ain't just no regular day. This is a snowy day where your vision um, isn't as good. This, this snowflake, in, the snow impacting how far you can see. Um, your footing isn't as good, yet decides uh, to embrace this lion um, in, in warfare. And what could be a bad situation sometimes can end up turning uh, into a good moment for you. Now, what do you mean, Rev? I want you to listen to the next few verses that build on what we heard earlier in the second chapter, Second Samuel, the 23rd chapter. Uh, we are introduced to a mighty warrior named Benea, who um, is a valiant fighter, and he goes into a pit to fight a, lo a lion, uh, and we perceive that he's going to end up dying there, but I want you to see what happens. Listen to the verses. And he struck down a huge Egyptian. Although the Egyptian had a spear in his hand, Benea went against him with a club, 
he snatched the spear from the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. Such were the exploits of Benea, son of Jehoiada. He too was as famous as the three mighty warriors. He was held in greater honor than any of the thirty, but he was not included among the three, and David put him in charge of his bodyguard. Now, this is where we're trying to go with this piece. That God is in the resume building business. What ends up sounding crazy, what ends up being the wrong place, what ends up being the wrong time, what ends up being the wrong situation, what ends up being you in the wrong city, what ends up being you in the wrong field, what ends up being you around the wrong people can actually be God setting up your resume for what God is about to do. And look, look at the words that are on the screen. God uses your past experiences to prepare you for your future opportunity. All right. But those God given opportunities often are disguised as man eating lions. Is that registering in, in your spirit? Look at your resume and look at the building blocks that have gotten you to where you are right now. Look at your past and the stuff that doesn't make any sense. The things that don't really line up with what you would love to do. The things sometimes that seem crazy. You look back on it and think to yourself, how in the world? Did I even make it through that? How in the world did I survive that season? How in the world did I um, survive that particular situation? And you look back on it, and sometimes God can take those ugly, jacked up, messed up moments and help to build your resume with it and set you up. What may look like a bad break ends up being a big break. And so we chase our God-ordained destinies by seizing the God are ordained opportunities. All right. Now you, you Benel had no idea what was coming next. All right? He had no idea. But the truth is, um, that situation, even though it could have ended up being a moment of death for him, um, strengthened uh, his journey. And when the story needed to be told, Benel definitely could put on his resume that. Uh, on a snowy day, he chased the lion and killed the lion. And, and so we, we chase our God-ordained destinies by seizing the God-ordained opportunities. And sometimes the God-ordained opportunities require you to take risk, require you to take risk. One of the life lessons that I want you to pull away from this is this. Taking no risk is the greatest risk of all. Look back on your life. How many times have you missed out on moments because you were afraid to take a risk? And I'm telling you, you don't want to live your life taking no risk because that's the greatest risk of all. Sometimes you got to seize the moment. Sometimes you got to chase the lion. Sometimes even on a, snow, a snowy day, you got to get down in that pit and go to war. All right. And it's going to require you to take a risk. There might be some moments where things, um, you take a risk and it does not work out the way you want it to. Mark Batterson in his book talks about some of the great risks that he's taken and how those great risks have turned into major successes. Not just for him, but for the ministry that he's a part of. But he also talks about some, some risks that he's taken and they end up not working out for the good. He goes on and, and defines stories of people who are connected to his ministry that he will talk about later in his book. And he talks about some who gave up Fortune 500 um, um, company jobs and went and started ministry and, and it worked out for him. But he also talked about some who, who quit other things to run for public office and they lost. Risks are a part of the journey. But if you don't take any, that's the greatest risk of all yeah um Madison also talks about another piece again just setting the tone for where we are trying to go and hopefully some of this stuff is is going to be helpful to you he also talks about um you know risk and regret uh, pretty much being a partnership and that there are um two types of regret there's the regret of action all right that is um wishing that you hadn't done something and then there's the regret of inaction 
which is wishing that you had done something. He goes on to describe them as sins of commission and sins of omission. All right. A regret of action is wishing you hadn't done some that, something. That is a sin of commission. All right. And then wishing you had done something is a sin of omission. And he talks about many persons um, living their lives and um, regretting inaction instead of regretting action. You can deal with action. All right. The sin of commission. Now, he says this: the church is fixated on sins of commission for far too long. And we got a long list of things that, that, that we shouldn't be doing. You know, you think of it by holiness, by subtraction. We think holiness is the byproduct of subtracting something from our lives that should not be there. And holiness certainly involves subtraction. But I think God is more concerned about sins of omission. Those things that we could have and should have done, it is, it's holiness by multi multiplication. When's the last time, um, or are you there right now, where you're wrestling with something and you want to do it, but you're, you're afraid? You want to do it, but there are risks. You want to do it, but you're afraid of how it might turn out. If it doesn't go well, then what? And you are willing because you're not, um, you're afraid to take the risk. You are willing to live your life um, with the regret of inaction. Who am I talking to? Is that you? I'm trying to challenge you today. Maybe we are led here. Maybe this specifically is for you. Maybe it's not for me. Maybe maybe it's not for um, some who are listening. But maybe this specifically is for you. That right now there is something in your spirit that God is trying to get you to do. And God does not want you to be five, ten months down the road, two years down the road having the regret of inaction because you were afraid to take a risk because you were afraid to be like our brother here in the text who went after what it is that he wanted dealt with the situation and here you are sitting on the sideline and i'm trying to tell you today that sometimes you gotta take the risk because if not you could end up at a place of um wishing you had done something all right now uh it, you know as it relates to the christian journey um you know Battison does a lot of you know he does talk about um holiness by subtraction that many of us live our lives um living in a way that uh, you know we think that if we subtract stuff off um you know it, it goodness uh, he says goodness is not the absence of badness. So we actually think that we're doing something because we're not doing bad stuff. When, listen, Baddison says you can do nothing wrong and still do nothing right. What are you offering up to the kingdom? All right. Now, our calling, Baddison says, has to be much higher than simply running away from what's wrong. God wants more than you just saying I worship God by not doing wrong but God is saying what are you doing what risk are you taking what is it that I'm calling you to do that takes you beyond just you sitting in the crib and saying that you ain't committing sin no you can sit around and do nothing and still do nothing right when we don't have the guts to step out in faith and chase lions, when we don't have the guts to step out in faith and chase our dreams, when we don't have the guts to step out in faith and chase what it is that God has for us to do, if we don't have the guts to jump out on faith, jump out in our faith, and begin to chase those things um, that God has, has, has called us to, um, then, then we actually are robbing God of the glory uh, that rightfully belongs to to God. Lion chasers are always on the lookout for God-ordained opportunities. 
when is the last time you opened up your eyes thinking about looking for what's the next opportunity instead of you sitting around complaining about what you can't do during COVID have you thought about maybe God um, is opening up some new opportunities for you maybe there are some new ways that God needs you to adjust to all right so when you don't have the guts to step out in faith and chase those lions you actually are uh, impacting stealing robbing God robbing glory that God is supposed to be getting all right so uh, really this is what I believe the, a, a part of the core of what Baddison wants us to walk away with maybe following God maybe following Christ isn't supposed to be as safe and as civilized as we've been led to believe maybe God was more dangerous and uncivilized than we were taught maybe Christ was more dangerous and civilized than we were taught and I believe this this challenges um, our uh, maturity as Christians all right and th this is what I believe Baddison wants us um, to see that spiritual maturity is seizing and um, seeing God ordained opportunities walking moving progressing heading embracing maybe that's what God wants you to do maybe God wants you to see it and seize it maybe God wants you to lay eyes on it and go after it even if what you are seeing requires you to take some risk even if what you are seeing requires you to move in some spaces and some places that are uncomfortable for you and I think that uh, this whole thing challenges our theology because for many of us I think we become comfortable and in your comfort you think that's what God wants and I'm I'm trying to tell you today I think that this whole chasing the lion um, thematic thrust is about getting outside of your comfort zone and um, walking into some arenas and into some situations where God can maximize what God is trying to do through you and then you can look back on it as it prepares and propels you for what is next so we got to look at what our spiritual maturity is and then we've got to look at what we define success as. Mark Batterson de de defines success as doing the best you can with what you have where you are. One of the sermons that I used to preach uh, focused on that when I first started preaching, doing the best that you can with what you have, making the most of every opportunity in every single situation maximizing what you have not trying to recreate who you are but maximizing what you have you are wonderfully made by God your gifts your talents your exterior your interior the way God made you God made you and if you could take what God made you and partner it with God's dreams um, and God's hope and God's thought and God's call for your life then I believe you can you can be successful are you doing the best you can with what you have where you are question mark and that's, that's a couple pieces to it am I doing the best I can with what I have where I am I'm not talking about where you're going I'm talking about where you are right now are you doing the best that you can right now with what you have and where you are so if you're going to chase the lion you, you've got to reevaluate how you perceive maturing in a spiritual way and you've got to embrace this definition of success. Think of every opportunity as God's gift to you. Think of every opportunity as God's gift to you. Every day 
as God's gift to you. Every moment as God's gift to you. Putting all this stuff together. Being successful where I am, what I have, doing the best that I can, and building on it by, by embracing every opportunity that God has for you. Now, what you do with these opportunities is your gift to God. All right? So, I am... Uh, I'm embracing it. Every morning I'm waking, every morning I'm waking up, I'm, I'm, I'm realizing that it is a gift from God. And what I do with it is my gift back to God. Every moment that I have is a gift from God. Every relationship that I have is a gift from God. What I do with those things is my gift back to God. All right. I've talked about success, but, but I want to circle back to it. All right. Your, okay, so... If success is doing the best that I can with what I have, where I am, then how I offer it uh, really becomes my stewardship. And so, so success equals stewardship and stewardship equals success. But maybe uh, our view of stewardship is too narrow. So what do we think stewardship is? My time talent and treasure that's what it is that's what we've always been taught and usually in church we talk more about the treasure part of it we don't talk as much about the time we don't talk as much about the talent but all of it is important my time is um my gift to god how i offer it up my talent is my gift to god how, how god how i offer it up my treasure is my gift to god and how I offer it up. But, but we've got to think about stewardship beyond those things. Um, Batterson talks about stewardship as it relates to how I think, my imagination, what, what goes on in, in the prefrontal cortex, right? You know, according to neurologist, he says. What about our, our stewardship of our, our competitive street? Everything, all inclusive. We got to be good stewards of every second of time and every ounce of energy. All right. So when you wake up, how much time are you um, gifting back to God? How much time are you wasting? How much time are you doing nothing or doing things that seem like something, but really at the end of the day, ain't nothing? Are you really doing the best you have with the, um, with, with, with the best that you have in you? Um, and are you doing it uh, where you are? Doing the best that you can with the best that you have. Are you offering it up? Are you giving God back, gifting back to God everything that uh, you can all right, in our lives, we have encountered some lions. Amen. In our lives, we've fallen into some pits. Amen. In our lives, we've, we've faced some, uh, some snowy days. All right? And we've weathered them individually. All right? And so, Battison says this. Maybe it's a God-sized dream that scares the living daylights out of you. Maybe it's a bad habit or a bad decision that finds you at the bottom of the pit. Or maybe a cloud of self-doubt casts a dark shadow on your future but to get to where god has you to be you're going to have to instead of running you've got to encounter instead of ditching and dodging sometimes you got to go in the pit instead of staying in the house and being afraid to go out in the snow and deal with it sometimes you got to put on your your snow boots and you got to go outside in this you got to be able to you got to encounter the lion Sometimes you got to fall into the pit. Sometimes you got to weather uh, the snowy days. All right. Now, when God answers a prayer or God fulfills a dream, then you do what? You manage it by preparing or by praying bolder prayers and dreaming bigger dreams. You go after a dream that is destined to fail without divine intervention. And, and that's what Batterson talks about uh, in this book. All right. 
he, he talks about when God answers a prayer and when God um, fulfills a dream, then you got to pray harder, pray bigger, go after something bigger. You go after dream. You only go after stuff that if there was no divine intervention, it would fail. When was the last time you took that type of risk? When was the last time you did something that you know if it had not been for God, that thing would have floundered? Some of the mess you're doing now is floundering because it does not have any divine intervention attached to it. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe you're doing stuff and you ain't praying. Maybe you're not seeking God to fulfill um, uh, to fulfill a dream. But I want to challenge you to do two things. First of all, to make sure that God is a part of what you're doing. And then second of all, to, to, to make sure that it's, it's something that you're going after, that if God was not involved in it, you know it will fail. You know it will fail. So the beauty of um, this type of mindset, going after something that you would fail if it was not for God's divine intervention, challenges us to to look at stuff in a different pers in a different perspective. And so, you know, we overestimate what we can comp accomplish in a year, but we underestimate what God can do in a decade. That's why we got to be um, chasing what it is that God wants us to chase. And not just be settling for the things that we think we can accomplish. Lion chasers are more afraid. And are you a lion chaser? That's the question. Are you a lion chaser? Will you become one? Lion chasers are more afraid of missing God-ordained opportunities than making a few mistakes along the way. You're going to make some mistakes. You're going to fail. There are going to be some times when you don't succeed. You know, I thought about this as I was reading. How many different times I have uh, done things and I failed because um, it just wasn't in God's plan for that particular thing to happen. But guess what? It was in those mistakes. It was in those failing moments that I've grown, that I've matured, that I've learned. I, I wrote down before Sometimes before the wins, you've got to take losses. you got to take losses. And I was out with um, two of my friends on, um, uh, on last week, and we, we, were talking about, we were talking about politics. And one of them said, you know, you lost before. You're asking me, you know, and yeah, I did. You know, some of you may not know this, but I, I ran for a political office in 2007 and I lost and I hated it. I did not like the way I felt and I promised myself that I would not ever do it again. But a few years later, I felt led and I did and I ended up winning. But if I hadn't have tried in 07, then it wouldn't have been a 2011. And if it wouldn't have been a 2011, it wouldn't be a 2020. And so sometimes you got to take that L. Sometimes things in life, um, you know, you're not going to always win. There are going to be some times when you don't win. There are going to be some times when you make wrong decisions. There are going to be some times when you make wrong um, choices. There are going to be some times when you really believe it's something for you, but it's not for you. And so God won't allow you to, to have it because God has something else for you. All right? But you've got to be... Um, you, you've got to be more afraid of missing out on what God has for you than you are in, in, in making mistakes. All right. So question for you. What if the life you really want in the future God wants for you is having right now in your biggest problem? In your worst failure? In your greatest fear? What if the life you really want and the future God wants for you is hiding right now? In that problem, in that failure, in that fear, you can't be afraid to go after it just because stuff is not working out for you. And you cannot use the place in your life, your age. You can't use that. The people out there right now, listen, just because you're past retirement age doesn't mean you're past your prime. 
Come on, I'm talking to somebody right now. You might be just hitting your prime. And maybe the retirement was a setup for you to move into what God has for you. It's never too late to become who you've always dreamed of being. Amen, somebody. How many stories um, are out there of people working jobs their whole lives, saving up money, only to retire to do what they've always wanted to do or to stop working a particular job in a particular space or doing a particular thing because God has something else for them to do. You got to understand and believe that it's never too late for you to be what God dreamed um, or what you dreamed of being. I I'm done. The greatest opportunities are the scariest lions. Remember that. Impossible odds set the stage for amazing miracles. The greatest opportunities for you are always the scariest things. Those things that have become blessings for you. Be honest. They scared the mess out of you. Yeah, you made it look easy because God ordained it for you. But think about it prior to you doing it. You were scared. You were scared filling out that application. You were scared going for that interview. You talked yourself out of it many times. The greatest ops are the scariest lions. Impossible odds, my brothers and my sisters, set the stage for amazing miracles. So, uh, this Bible study series is uh, a survival guide for lion chasers. And what we're going to do over the next um, several weeks is to teach you some lion chasing skills. And you see them right here. We're going to deal with defining odds. We're going to deal with facing fears. We're going to deal with reframing problems. We're going to deal with embracing uncertainty and taking risks and seizing opportunities. And sometimes it's going to require you to look foolish. All right. So odds, fears, problems, uncertainty, risk, um, see, seizing ops and looking for all of that is a part of um, chasing a lion. All right, but chasing the lion is what's going to get you to where you need to be. Thank you for joining us uh, today for our Bible study. We've shifted. Um, we've completed a backup. Now we're looking at 2 Samuel, the, the 23rd chapter, uh, and we're going to be wrestling with what does it take to chase lions in 2020. All right, and so I'm looking forward to helping you, helping me, develop some of these lion chasing skills. Uh, if you are a part of the Mount family, I'm gonna ask that you jump on Zoom with us real quickly. You see the Zoom link right there on the screen. Those of you on Uber Conference, I'm gonna ask that you just hang on. Listen, I really miss talking to you and seeing you. So if you're on Bible, Bible study, why don't you jump over real quickly? Jump over so we can see your face. Jump over so we can hear your voice. Jump over so you can uh, hear about some of the things that are going on at the Mount. For the rest of you who are not going to jump on, thank you for being with us today. And I pray that you tell somebody else to check out this Bible study series. Also, join us on Sundays at 1045 right here, wherever you're listening or watching. Jump on for worship. And if you want to bless the ministry, well, we would love it. Go to smzbc.org, give online. You can do cash app, dollar sign, um, uh, SMZBC. You can do Venmo, you can do text to give, and you can drop it off here at 14 West Duval Street, Richmond, Virginia, uh, 23220. God bless you. See you next Wednesday, same place, same time. For the rest of you, jump on Zoom, stay 